Welcome to Frost Sessions, the Frost School of Music's official podcast. On this week's episode, Emmy Award winner for the series Godless, composer of The Queen's Gambit, and our program director of the media writing and production program, Carlos Rivera, interviews legendary producer of Netflix's original series, The Queen's Gambit, Mick Aniceto, and music editor, Tom Kramer. Tune in to this very special episode as the trio explores the sound fabric of film, what it takes to thrive in Hollywood's production and music industry, and as we take a journey through the soundscape of The Queen's Gambit. Thank you for joining us today, and remember to stay tuned to Frost Sessions. Hello, hey, my name is Carlos Rafael Rivera. I'm the program director of the media writing and production program at the Frost School of Music. I'm also a composer on a show called The Queen's Gambit, and I'm privileged uh, to have uh, my music editor, who I'll allow him to introduce himself. His name is Tom Kramer. Go ahead, Tom, and you can pass it on to Mick. Yeah, I'm Tom Kramer as a music editor and score producer on the show and worked with Carlos for a lot of years. You're up, Mick. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mick Aniceto. I am the producer on The Queen's Gambit. Specifically, I produced all the posts and visual effects and had the lovely pleasure of working with these two guys now on our, our second show together. First one was Godless and last one was The Queen's Gambit. All right. So one of the reasons why I brought you both on it's not just because tom is like a fantastic music editor but in watching what mick's role was in godless and and watching him put and manage so many things as in uh, in, in the queen's gambit i was kind of thinking this would be an interesting conversation to even start off with what your role was on the show and to give a perspective to not only my colleagues in the music school but also the people who are watching who are not in music um what it is that you do and and how it is that you manage us to not get fired from our jobs so if you don't mind take it away yeah i mean the, the the latter part of that sentence is a little tough you know it was, it was it's definitely a perfect alchemy to make sure that you and tom don't get fired you know but no that's a joke everybody they're awesome so you know, try. <laughs> so you know the, the the role of producer really is like uh, for, for me in post, I help assemble basically the whole post-production team. You know, a lot of times the studio will approach me with a project and say, you know, there's this uh, project, whether it's a feature film or a series or a documentary, and these are the creatives. Uh, generally, it's a producer or, or a writer or a director, and they need somebody to help them uh, connect with the whole post team. And post is, you know, an editor, uh, assistant editors, a music editor, a lot of times a composer um, and visual effects and, you know, a colorist and all of that stuff to put together the final polish on a show. And fortunately with the uh, Godless and the Queen's Gambit, you know, uh, Tom and Carlos, they both had an excellent um, relationship with Scott Frank, uh, the creator. So uh, that was one big piece of the puzzle that I wasn't responsible for connecting the dots with. But a lot of times that's what my role as a producer is to, to match creatives with other creatives. And then once that's done, I, I get, you know, here's, here's the part of money you can play with, you know, and I have to you know, work with everybody and doling out how much, uh, you know, uh, of each of this pot that everyone can have, you know, and as we go along, I'm, you know, keeping a mind on it and you know, dealing with a schedule, putting things together in terms of, all right, this is when we're getting footage from production and this is when editorial is going to get it. And this is when, you know, the editor will hand it off to the, the music team and they'll start composing things and, and putting ideas together. And then all the way through to uh, sending cuts to the studio, the network, and then, then final delivery for when it goes out to the world. So, um, you know, a lot of it really is like what we're doing now is talking. And I'm sure, especially Tom, because Tom and I were um, in the same room uh, or in the same area for a long time that, you know, we, we talk a lot and that's kind of the, uh, you know, the way that the harmony works on a lot of the productions is that if you have open communication and everyone has trust and uh, the ability to speak when when things are not working and when things are great, you know, that's easy. The, the, the good times are easy. It's when things are hard is really when uh, you really show what you have, your chops as a producer to be able to juggle all of uh, the different tasks with all the different needs, um, with everyone in the production. So in a nutshell, that's that's kind of what I do. That's crazy because I mean, there's, I know there are a couple of really weird and rough moments throughout the production that happened and I never felt you tense. I've never felt you like, and so you're, I think that's one of the great things that you were able to 
bring to this because I never felt your worry. And and it's funny how people don't talk about it much, but that is um, it's contagious. The negative energy stuff, you know what I mean? When things aren't working out, like you just kind of hang up and you're like, oh my God, you know? Yeah. And I never felt you, you're like, hey, it looks like we're pretty screwed right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that's, that's kind of the magic behind being a good producer. You know, it's like, I, I know where my strengths are and it's not writing music or editing music or you know, coming up with music choices like the way you and Tom do. So I, I know, you know, how to surround myself with the actual talent, you know, with the people that I know I can go to, like Carlos Tom, how are we going to do this? Because there's this crazy virus, this coronavirus that's coming around. And how are we going to now split up? And, you know, Carlos, you have to stay in Florida. Tom, you have to stay in New York, even though I know you want to go to California. But, uh, you know, uh, so it, it was tough for a while, you know, and a lot of it is, you're right, you know, I, I try to, like a duck, you know, you're just cool on top, but underneath I'm paddling like, like hell. So the, the the idea of remaining and keeping that cool is something that happens. You know, it's a trickle down because you know, luckily Bill Horberg, our executive producer, was that way too. Super cool cat and yeah. was not easily ruffled. And you know, and and Scott also. Scott has a very strong a way to collaborate. He knows what he knows and he knows where he needs to, to lean. And right. those walls and the people, those pillars that he needs to lean on, just like you, Tom, Wiley Stateman, Michelle Tesoro, you know, the, he knows that everyone is really good at what they do. So he'll just back off and say, all right, you help me solve this problem, which is what I do. I, you know, I'll, I'll go to you, I'll go to Tom, like Tom. Um, so we're behind, how do we fix this? You know, so, <laughs> and a lot of it, like I said, it's, it's, it's communication. You know, I had never had any, worry speaking to you or Tom about what was the like brass tax like I don't have the money to do this I don't have the time to do that so what can we do and right. you know, there's a lot of because we're all you know a little masochistic and that we love the art so much that we bleed for it and I think yes. that's what makes it special you know that's what made Queen's Gambit and Godless so special for me uh, is that we all just loved and connected with the material so much that we were willing to work extra long, um, you know, whether it's 24 hour days or seven days a week, you know, like I, I, I know that Tom definitely did some stuff uh, that I wasn't paying him for, which I completely appreciate. And you, Carlos, I know you were writing sketches for Scott, like, you know, years before we were even yeah. rolling on yeah. our first frame. So, you know, that right. was a, a very, very special, you know, um, just, formation of people that we put together for this project. I think Tom was just telling me he was going to send you the bill for those hours. So just, <laughs> just before you came on. Yeah, so, I know. I got, I got part one of the, the, the six installments <laughs> that I know I owe. I know. So, uh, but I mean, maybe that's a good handoff to Tom because it, it'd be good for, for, again, for folks to understand what a music editor is. Because when I was doing like class, more focused to classical music, I heard of music editors and I was like, oh, that's cool no idea what they did and i think it would be good if if tom you could talk a little bit about like what your role generally is and maybe bring it a little bit more to the project but then just generally how it is that you help us you know stay keep our jobs basically sure um well uh, first off want to uh thank mick for all all his help and he's really one of the great ones to work with um yeah if given the opportunity um as far as music editing generally um kind of two parts to the process on a normal project where you might come in and the picture's just been shot and the director is putting it together and they usually have a certain amount of time to do that. And during that time, you're looking for songs and temporary music usually to put into show preview audiences to get some feedback. And while that's going on, a composer will be hired and then you're working with that person to spot the music, figure out where you want everything, and then also um, get them rolling to replace all that temporary music you found. Uh, working with Carlos and Scott on, on their shows, basically now there is no temp. Carlos is writing from before, like Mick said, the first frame is shot. Uh, Scott Frank likes to have in his head themes already, so when he's shooting and it helps dictate some things for him. So. It's great for us that the director never has a chance to fall in love with anything other than what his final music will be. Um, there's, there's a thing called temp love, which some directors succumb to. But um, so that's what once 
Carlos has written and he'll he'll start handing me demos back that all of them present to Scott or, or the, the director and uh, um, start getting feedback and start that back and forth process. Luckily on Queen's Gambit, it was, there were a lot more yeses than, than no, than no's certainly for the demos. I mean, even, I think we've got one seven minute piece in, um, in the last episode, there were no notes on it just sailed through. And I know that was a, a huge effort for Carlos. Um, then uh, once we, we get approval on the school, on the, uh, on the demos, then um, start booking recording studios if it's, if it's orchestra or band or whatever. So with, with COVID, we kind of had to, it, it presented some of its own challenges as a lot of studios weren't yet working. So we luckily snuck in right as things started to open back up for the recording studios and got in. So then we'll, we'll record um, all the orchestra then when it comes back, it gets mixed. And then on these projects, I'll then do the first pass of mixing the music against all the final dialogue and sound. And then we handed it off to uh, Eric and, and Wiley who did the finish pass on it. And okay. uh, that's, that was kind of the process on this one. This would be good for time for you to make to talk about like what Wiley statement, who's not on this uh, call. He's the sound designer. We also call him Obi-Wan Kenobi and Eric Hirsch and Eric Kane did and, and how the role of sound plays and how it affected our post-production process. Maybe if you want to speak a little bit to that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, again, going back to the, there's a very fortunate setup that we had is we had a, what's called a rolling mix uh, during editorial, during post, which is not, is very uncommon for series. You know, it's a, it's a very much a, a feature process in that you, we like, like Thomas saying, you're dealing with final elements from the get, you know, that, the, that you don't have to temp things, whether it's score, source music, sound effects, d clean, cleaned up dialogue. So that is very much a, a Wiley statement made uh, process for us. And it is, it's beautiful. It allows, you know, at the end of the day, Scott to explore the sound fabric from the very first time he sees an assembly of a scene. Um, Cause traditionally, what will happen on a series is that your temp uh, sound and temp music, for example, you will be sitting with for weeks, if not months, until the final piece of your schedule where that, okay, now let's send all this temp stuff to a composer, so let's send it to a sound team to start cleaning up dialogue, to start writing score that sounds somewhat like the temp or gives us that same feeling. And then you're, that's when you start you know, experimenting with stuff. And at that point, you have maybe two, three weeks before you have to say, all right, that's it. Let's send it off in the world. And that really doesn't allow for a lot of exploration uh, the way that the rolling mix does in that, you know, the way uh, the, the chess pieces move with the score. Um, so there's so much in the sound design of the, the chess piece, you know, the, the felt running across the wooden board and the way that the, the beautiful, you know, strings or piano that um, you're making, Carlos, how, how all of that plays into the scene because so much of this particular project is in her head, you know, and the, the way that the sound mix was just constantly evolving requires, and just like I was saying before, just incredible communication between sound, music, editorial, and the director, that everyone had no ego about what they were doing. Everyone knew that, okay, this is the first pass at what we want to articulate with the feeling of the scene. So, you know, Tom and Carlos really got to present something that could move Scott, could move our editor, Michelle, in that like, oh, that, the way that sounds, I may want to linger on this shot a little bit more and vice versa in that if, Carlos and Tom sent something to Michelle to cut, you know, as far as a, a score, a piece of score or a piece of music, and something just wasn't quite hitting in terms of when the strings start or when the, you know, the crescendo happens, we would just, we would all listen to it together. And I think we all knew it, 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 without even speaking, like this, this needs to be changed. And that's where, you know, you, uh, Carlos and Tom became so valuable that like you, we didn't even have to say what was wrong. We all felt it. And then you were able just yeah. to change the composition altogether to make that scene flow beautifully. And, you know, the, the thing that makes that difficult, you know, is really is like the, the time and the cost. 
because a rolling mix, the you know you you like I said traditionally you you know a composer and a music editor and like a, a full sound team don't come on toward a little bit later on in the process. Whereas you guys started from the very beginning, you know, so that's a kind of a bigger price tag for the production to to hold. Um, and then the same thing with schedule in that you know you guys were constantly getting turned over turnovers from editorial, meaning you know Michelle, our editor, would cut a scene. And then, you know, would send it to Scott and then send it to you and you would do your thing, you know, add your music, edit it specifically to that scene. And then Scott, Michelle and Bill Horberg, our executive producer, they'd be like, mm, I think we want to change the scene and let's shake it all up, you know, like it completely change. So then 48 hours after you've already delivered something, we've changed it already. So you have to change it again, you know, do a reconform, meaning, you know, you have to match your music to the new picture edit. And that was constantly happening in order for this evolution and this exploration to happen, which is no small feat, you know, and I know that Tom, that that, that is a big undertaking that a lot of friends of mine and a lot of colleagues that I know, I, there's a team of people that do what you do, you know, that do just like you're, well, you're, you are the captain of that and there's usually like three or four other people so you know kudos and hats off because i know that it's not uh, an easy thing to do but because everyone comes into it like i said with just no ego you know like there's no pretense of like mm, no my my work needs to stay untouched you know like everyone was so uh willing to to adapt to the changes um and you know that that was the the thing that i spoke to wiley about and that you know that was what makes this special that's what makes a rolling mix work is that everyone was open to communication and because i think that it allows you guys the freedom to give you know your your creativity your feedback on things outside of just music you know that you have the Crazy. the freedom to venture into other lanes whether it be picture editorial visual effects sound design you know and then that was that again that, that was such a cool thing that you did you guys did with the the the, the sound of the talk the clocks ticking that was brilliant and how you were able to weave that into the score uh it was just so magical Cool, and I appreciate you saying that also about sound because I, I think a lot of folks watch movies and but don't really realize how important sound is. And I even tell my students um, that that to me, if I had to do this all over again, I would actually become a sound designer. I wouldn't do music, and because the it's so crazy and it's such an inner world of creating the illusion that to know the fact that about 80% of what you're hearing in a film is fake or made up or ADR or additional dialogue recording or, or it's not real. It's, it's to me magic. And, um, and it really is important to kind of underscore the, the power of what a movement of a chess piece does to you as physically as a reaction, as an audience reacting to the scene. There's a moment I know that and it's over the top, but you have to pay attention to it. If you're not paying attention, it just moves you. But there's a moment when when um, when Beth like looks up at the ceiling, like at, towards the end of the moment where she kind of has this realization thing. There is uh, there the when she moves the piece, it's actually like the sound of a whip. It goes whoosh, it, and it's impossible. That would never happen in reality. But it's there and it goes along with the movie and no one's aware of it. But that's what Wiley brings. And that's the kind of magic that sound does in conjunction with music. So I love collaborating and getting to, like you said, getting to be able to speak and collaborate with sound. Most, mostly, I think Tom and I spend a lot of time speaking to the sound design folks because we do wanna make a holistic aural landscape that works. I, I tread very carefully with Michelle. I think I called her once or twice to say, please. And she was like, well, maybe if I, if I can, I'll do it, but don't count on it, you know? Because the cut is, is king, you know, or queen. Get it? That's, oh my God, I said it. I did it. I did the joke. But uh, I'll let Tom take over because I got drilling in the background about a little bit speak about that, that what Mick just talked about. Yeah, it, it really is great that um, it's, it's sort of like family now, at least Scott Carlos and I have done pretty much all of Scott's projects together. Um, and Carl, I think I've done all of Carlos's minus, minus one thing. And um, it is great that I can even like walk into Michelle's room or something and say, Hey, you know what, can we just add three frames to this shot? Because just tempo wise, it's, it's completely messing us up. And 
you definitely certain editors you you tread very lightly in those kind of suggestions because like like Mick said you know their work has to shine through and it's what it is versus you know it's it's a tenth of a second or less you know and, and uh, just just help us out musically but um, yeah and working with son I, I I kid Carlos that uh, he you know he'll, he'll tell me oh yeah I just talked to Wild I did yes it's, it's okay well you know I he, I just kid him that he talks to the sound people more than any composer. I've ever worked with, which to his, to his, I mean, obviously to his credit now, you know, we're, we're all kind of family and, uh, and it is great having the, the kind of rolling mix. The, when we were set up in New York, the, the Eric, uh, Eric was right next door to me. So we could just go back and forth and exchange, exchange ideas or say, Hey, you know what, could we, could we try that, you know, maybe make room, room for some music here in this spot or, 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 uh, or, get, or can you guys cover us with some sound here in these spots? And, um, and it's all, uh, every, like I said, every, everybody's very open and willing to try and accommodate everybody else for the betterment of the project. You know, Tom, one, one thing I was gonna ask you also to speak on is, is how, um, outside of the music that I wrote, like how you actually work to, co to add, like Randy Poster was a music supervisor for the show. And he, can you, people have been asking me about like, how did you pick the sound, the songs? And I take full credit for that. No, I'm just right. kidding. No, I, did <laughs> I was like, I so have like all this knowledge of all these really great 60s pop tunes and no, but, but can you speak to me a little yeah. bit? Because I really want to know myself, like right. how, how some of these songs were picked and not picked and were replaced, right. sure. which would be cool. Um, in this case, yeah, that's, that's as, as a music editor, you sort of have to deal with all the background instrumental music that Carlos or the composer would, would write. But then you also have to deal with all the songs, which is generally outside of their, their realm. So um, oftentimes there's a music supervisor whose job, some, some are more creative than others. Some are very creative, like Randy gave us some great, great submission stuff. And some are really just there to say, you know, hey, we found these songs, we want them, go license them, you know, do the paperwork and get, get it going. But um, Randy, um, and Milena, his assistant, would send um, uh, submissions for each spot that we'd spotted for for source music. And um, generally, they'll just give me a ton of submissions. I'll kind of line them all up and see which ones I think work and kind of narrow that down to a more manageable level because directors generally don't want to sit through 30 alternates of uh you know of some department store music um but uh so we'll get those and then um and then it's up to uh scott to uh you know to choose choose which ones are working for him and uh and hopefully then they're available and affordable and uh and and, and actually in queen's gambit the the song in the montage the french french song tut tut which is a cover of or a, such a cool song such yeah. a cool song and and um that we, we found and i I'd given scott like six or seven things but that was kind of my favorite and it turned out to be everybody's favorite and then we got to the final mix in july and it's the publishers i believe one one was deceased and it was their estate that they were trying to get a hold of and i think is it in france that july yeah. is basically a holiday so you can't get a hold of anyone they couldn't get permissions or clearances on uh, on it, and we and we're trying to find some alternates, and nothing was as good. And we were just all keeping our fingers crossed. And finally, I don't know if it was you, Mick, or or for Andy, or how how it came about, but finally, we like, at how the did it happen? Last, hold hold on, we got to know how it happened. How did we get a hold? Who who called back? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't. I'm, I'm guessing it went to Randy first, uh, yeah. but. Yeah. Um, uh yeah but it, it we, we were like just i don't know a day away two days away or something like that from having to turn this whole thing over not knowing if we could have this song and then finally we got it and everybody was just so happy that you know yeah. it's, it's, it's i don't know why that song really is the one that stuck to me because of the da, 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 and it was just such a weird quirky perfect little song and but it, what's also interesting about about this process and i um getting to discover and read like in interviews with other folks like i don't know how to say his name uli Han hanish uh sure. Mick? Sure. I'll just, we'll go with that he's the set designer and you know for or for the, for the show itself is how focused everybody is on their craft and what they do 
and how incredible, like how people are appreciating the sets, the wallpaper, for example, Scott was making a joke that Uli's going to start his own wallpaper company because of the prints in the show. And, uh, but uh, Gabriela uh, Binder, I believe, is like the, the, the costumes and how detailed those things are and the checkered pattern, I mean, checkered chess patterns or the squares or, you know, the idea, like whatever the shirt is, which is not intentional um, to wear. But the idea of that playing subconsciously throughout the show or playing consciously in the production uh, goes back to also the fact that I didn't notice. Um, I wasn't paying attention to the songs. The only one I noticed was that one because it's just a weird song. And, and to hear and to, to read so many amazing uh, uh, comments about the soundtrack, meaning the, the, the songs used and how they kind of put people in their place. And a lot of folks who are a bit older who grew up in that time are like, oh my God, I hadn't heard that in a great, in a long time. And what a great a placement of the song. It just speaks to kind of like the, the level I feel like I got to work with because like yourself, Mick and, and, and Tom, it's like, you're all bringing your best game. And so the joke for me is to kind of bring mine as it's to kind of climb up and, and, and kind of get in the room because it's all good. And, and I've learned to appreciate that, but it's funny to me how focused I was on just the music and sound. And then to see all these other parts come together that I didn't even notice things in like the last thing I'll say, it's kind of nerdy, but the, the acting, which I, I was already very aware of how awesome she was through the dailies, Anya Taylor Joy. But this thing with her with, with the hand that people have been like doing and doing memes and stuff like that, I never noticed it like the whole time. And it seems to be like her thing. It's the poster of the show. I never noticed that this was a thing she did. And, and, and that's the kind of you go, oh, my God, man, you're just so focused on your job that that when you get to look up and now it's it's been a a thrill to do that, man. So anyways, um, I think, I think it's time. I think we're getting close, right, Mick? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I think that you really hit it. I mean, I've, all, all of the, the things that we've been discussing, you know, as far as uh, music and incorporating with sound, um, your, you know, your, your notion that once you saw the production design, once you saw Anya's performances in the dailies, you knew that you had to step up, you know, and that's what, uh, you know, Michelle and I, when we were talking about this, when we were first seeing dailies, like, wow, this is, this is going to be something, you know, you felt it. And it's, it's, you know, I've done, and I'm sure you guys know when you've done a few things, you can sense like, okay, this is different than what you normally get, you know, and um, it, it was kind of a joke that we had in, in the cutting room for a little bit, like, who's our audience, you know, like, who's going to watch a chess movie as seven hour chess movie like you know but but it was more than that you know it was it was a story of triumph and struggle addiction and genius and madness and it was so you know magnetic these characters that uh, you know not it, it wasn't uh, you know it wasn't hard to imagine that people were able to really find escapism in Beth's journey you know and I think that the, the what you're talking about not realizing kind of these you know the hand and stuff like that is because there's so many things that just hit on so many levels that you know is one of those things like I've had friends tell me that they're on their third fourth watch and every single time they're seeing something new you know and I, I and it's so crazy because I was like whoa you know it's it's one of those you know it's like Tarantino Scorsese it's like Christopher Nolan, like these things that you were planted kind of subconsciously that I, I, you know, I'm sure Scott had some degree of understanding to it, but it's like, because everyone was delivering at such a high level, there are so many things that you want to be immersed with in the world that you're seeing on, on your screen that every, every part of the frame is something new when you, when you see it, because like once you, yeah. once you stop seeing this, then you start hearing that, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and I have to say this because I, I caught this or my wife caught it because she's so much better at this whole thing than I am. It's, it's really weird, but um, for example, cinema, cinematography, Steven Meisler, there's a scene when we have to sell her house and her stepfather is asking for it and there's a conversation and the camera shot is cameras on him and the cameras on her camera starts overhead for her a little bit and under him so this is cinematic language stuff that i'm learning and i'm 50 you know what i mean and i'm like and i and i get to see this thing where where the conversation begins with him being the authority and steven starts to actually raise the camera 
on the guy to make him little and lower the camera on Beth's character as she's saying, I'm, I'm, I'll buy the house, dude. I don't, I'm fine. And all of a sudden the camera slowly, you know, pans down and all of a sudden she's over the frame. And I was like, oh my God, that's so cool. Like things like that, you get to nerd out on. And, and obviously to bring it all back, because we haven't talked about it, is Scott Frank, who is the brilliant mind behind it and saw this as something that could work from the beginning, you know? And, and I think the writing, I noticed the writing tricks that he does and they're not tricks, they're like, you know, craft stuff, but it, how he would place something and pay it off later. This happens throughout the show in scenes that you wouldn't even pay attention to, but he's so good at that. And, and it is there on the third watch or the fourth watch, the idea of the scene of, of um, and it's a simple thing, not like even a deep thing, but uh, Beth with Jolene brushing her teeth in the, in the, in, in the orphanage. And then when we see, uh, Jolene again they're brushing their teeth again there's a there's a moment of that that little thing is a callback and it's such it seems like nothing but it kind of is everything you know it's a good way to tie things together so um anyways I'll stop talking because they're drilling again <laughs> yeah and I think you know when going again going back to kind of the, the students who are probably this you know listening to this and who this is geared for for music and for sound you, know, you alluded to it earlier how important sound is and I think that uh, the the lay viewer the common viewer doesn't realize that for almost everything that you're seeing in a movie theater or in a television show it's been created you know the sound of it has been created that it wasn't that's how it was when you you know when they shot it you know and I think that is one thing is you know going to school and then studying the craft and once you start learning out it like how visceral that reaction becomes when you can marry the picture with the sound perfectly that it then elevates everything that you're seeing on your screen and I think they you know they the the really difficult part is what you guys do is is find the this emotional theme that you convey with music you know like that is so subjective you know because one person can hear a d minor in a way different way than another person can hear a d minor you know like it but it, it evokes different emotions but you have this you know this magic that you know as a producer it's so like wow we we, we, I found someone who can translate what this means, like the, the feeling that the, that Beth is struggling or the feeling that Beth is now getting her friends back and now she's going to lead this charge. You know, that's, that's something very special. And I think that is a, a really hard thing to find. Uh, but, the, you know, and I think that what makes it so successful, again, is going back to the open collaboration that Scott has, that he's empowered us all to be the best whatever we are to him you know whether it's a production designer director of photography composer music editor producer like there are avenues wide avenues that he's giving us to like okay impress me you know and, and then he then tailors that tailors this incredible source of creativity you know he's like sculpting he's and and going you know to a dad joke that you like too is playing chess with all of us you know we're all the different pieces on his board that he's put together and wants to, you know, move strategically in order to execute this, this thing, you know, and, and I, I joke a lot of times is the way he writes is, is so good for the people on his team, you know, like, for example, the, 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 the chess pieces when he had written it, when you first see it, it's bat light figures descend from the darkness of the ceiling. And like, how do you translate that, you know, and I, know, I, know, I love that. Get, you know, it, it's so brilliant the way he writes it and it it yeah. paints a picture but you're not quite sure what that picture is what it looks like what it sounds like and then we all start this crazy mind meld and you know that's that's the you know that that is the the trick that we try to play as filmmakers is that you know you can take a very simple idea or a very complex complex idea and translate it in a way that will convey a certain feeling that uh, you know audiences can really you know find emotion find truth to to what it is that we're trying to tell and like uh, the the going back to the importance of the sound and the music like that is you're absolutely right there's so many things that the the, the normal audience doesn't quite and nor nor should they you know nor should the normal audience have to understand yes. that the, the sound and the music are working such harmony to give you this feeling that is our jobs you know that's our jobs and for all all the students that you know keep finding that keep looking for the ability to tell a feeling with a certain chord a certain instrument and that that is something that you know I think that you guys really explore and I think the um the 
the, the real you know fortunate part for me is that like you know it, it's easy for me to to tell to tell you what's what I like. It's harder to explain why something is bad and how to fix it. Oh and my think, gosh, yeah, for sure. Know, for and sure. I think that's where, where you guys come in is that like again we we can all listen to a certain demo of a, a source queue or even a score queue, and we'll we'll feel it. We'll all feel it. There will be a feeling you know uh, as we're watching, and then you'll know how to fix it. You know whether it's switching an instrument changing a chord progression changing a note you know and that's that's all with just doing it you know just just trying out certain things and coming up you know on the other side taking a breath after just really getting into it getting into it and then and then seeing it and then again it goes about no ego no ego about this has to stay because i spent weeks or months or years doing this well it's kind of like the bottom yeah. line with with that mick is that uh you know we're all there to serve the final product you know, as, as much as we want our little avenue to be featured, you know, it's, it's like, True. if it's not working, you know, if it's like even playing a cue back for, for Scott or anyone, you know, it's like Carlo, I, Carlos or I might think it's the best thing ever written to picture. And, and if Scott doesn't feel the same way, there's, I'm just wasting my time and his, if I try to explain to him why, it, why, why he should like it. Yeah, you know, just uh, exactly. And it, Tom, it, Tom, it, I think has taught me a lot about that. Actually, if you could speak to how you actually navigate the no's and making them yeses, without it being the same cue. Um, yeah, I think um, generally with our processes, Carlos will send up a bunch of demos, and then I'll arrange some time with Scott or, or pre pre COVID. Um, anyway, when when we got to be in the same room, uh, Scott would come in. I just you know have a list of things to show. And um, yeah, some notes, uh, thankfully we do have this working relationship and, 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 and a trust built up um, between all of us that, you know, I can, I can get some feedback from Scott and, and if he's got cer certain notes, I can address and just say, oh, you know what, if I, if I do this, I think that'll, that'll take care of this one problem you have, you know, um, or sometimes, uh, you know, sometimes it might be a more major thing that Carlos needs to readdress. Um, and, and just in running meetings, it's sort of, they're just sort of a strategy. You know, if you're getting a bunch of yeses, okay, keep going, maybe play a couple extra cues that you hadn't planned on because you just got the right vibe. You know, if somebody comes in in a bad mood and they're just going to dislike everything right off the bat, no matter what you do, then, uh, you know, maybe stop, call, make the meeting a little shorter than you planned and, uh, you know, save those for the next time. But that's the genius right there. That's the experience. If you guys can look up Mick Anaceto on IMDb and look up Tom Kramer on IMDb, and compare that to the three credits I have and you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, uh, but it's true. And, and the thing is, uh, Tom, that, that psychology aspect of it is something that comes with, I think, a lot of experience and you know how to play the room. And there is so much to be said about that because a cue could live or die by the mood of the director. And from what you're saying, Tom, it's very much a, 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 the case, right? Yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, I, I got to tell the quick story of the first time I played a first time working with Scott and Carlos was in the room we barely knew each other and I played a piece of temp music for a walk among the tombstones and uh I, I played it for Scott and he just looked at me and said that's the worst piece of music I've ever seen up against a piece of film you know and and I just looked at I, I just looked at him and, and just started laughing laughing you know I just turned and laughed and said okay let's try this next one you know and um <laughs> it, you know just just it was funny to me anyway but those meetings can go anywhere from you know a complete three pitch strikeout to a grand slam home run and you never know until you get into it how how it's going to go but um yeah just yeah it's it's amazing man and again i think i think we should close because i figure people are already either checked out but i'm going to do the sign or the signal to like call it a day this is this is our hand signal we did with andrea who's running this whole thing guys by the way andrea vidal is like helping us organize our technology so I do want to say what me, go go Tom. Let me say one more thing just for the for the hometown crowd. Fine, fine. Um, when we started this project and we just you know the last thing we did together was Godless, so we had you know gun battles and horses and all kinds of things going on that you know we could hide behind a little bit as far musically here. We we didn't have to you know carry the shoulder as much of the you know as much of the load as as uh, we did on this and i i told scott and carlos me coming in i probably might have told you mick as well that you know this is the first i've done the, like 130 movies or something and i told scott i said this is the first time i'm really a little nervous or anxious 
about the heavy lifting the score is going to have to do. And um, so just kudos to Carlos and, and uh, for just kind of knocking it out of the park. As much as I hate to tell him this, you know, he knows I know I sure he's but, suffering but, inside <laughs> folks. Just know that it's hurting him really hard right now. <laughs> we, we live to make each other miserable. Um, Literally. So, <laughs> but uh, no, just uh, kudos to Carlos and, and for Mick's support along the way with. Uh, yeah, man. Thanks, Mick. We had to do to help make our jobs easier and possible. Yeah, it was a, it was a thrill to get to work with you, Mick, and of course again, Tom, and um, and it was a learning experience again for for me for sure. So uh, I'm glad we got to do this, and I'm glad you guys agreed to get together and talk a little bit and, and share with the audience of what you do, you know, and get to hear some hammers and drills in the background as well. So that's kind of cool. But uh, thank you guys so much, and thanks for uh, for helping and 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 for being here, and for all the folks that are watching at the Frost School of Music. Um, I'm grateful for your time and. For the folks who are watching at the University of Miami, thanks. And for the people who are outside of the University of Miami, wow. Anyways, thanks so much, guys. Have a good one. Thank you, everybody. Bye.